All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I say we get going. Uh, my colleagues will let people in as they join. Uh, I want to first check that you can see my screen. You can see the slide correctly. You can hear me. Just uh, hit me with a thumbs up. Excellent. Got a thumbs up from Catherine. I will then proceed. So, oh, excellent. excellent. Some thumbs ups in the audience. Thank you. So uh, welcome to our final NOBAC talk of 2022. You've come to the right place if you want to hear about norms and behavior change, because that's what NOBEC stands for after all. So let's talk about what the agenda is looking like today. So first of all, we have a welcome from me, Shaun Lahiri, a postdoctoral uh, researcher in the philosophy, politics, and economics program at the University of Pennsylvania, and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. Good to be with you here today. Uh, so I'm just going to go over a few uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, and then we will get into an early career researcher video by a surprise early career researcher. Who's it gonna be, who knows? Uh, but the person is very good, I can assure you of that. Then we will have our main event, uh, which is Professor Catherine DeVries. She's gonna deliver a talk for us. And then uh, we will have a, a brief little Q and A afterwards uh, where she can answer some questions that the audience may have. So uh, feel free to add questions in the chat and um, Later on during the Q&A, we can also take some hands if you want to raise your hand, but you know, put it in the chat in case you forget, basically. Um, now, just to let everybody know, if this is your first time at a NOBEC talk, uh, they're great talks. They happen about once a month, and they're organized by us, the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania. Here. And uh, just to let you know, this is our website. Have a look if you're interested in what we do. We basically do a lot of work related to consulting, research, and training on not just social norms, but behavioral, behavioral science, behavior change in general. So anything with norms and behavior, that's us. Uh, we love that stuff. So our Novak talks, uh, you know, we're, we're ending 2022, but we have a whole schedule for 2023 lined up. It should be pretty good. And our next talk will happen in January, on January 19th uh, by Professor Erta Xiao from Monash University. So I encourage you to attend that as well as all the other talks we got going on until the rest of the 2023. So a lot of interesting, exciting stuff going on. Um, then what do we got here? So we, you know, a few ground rules. Uh, Catherine will talk and during that talk, uh, please mute yourself, make sure you're muted. Uh, I don't like the econ style where people interrupt speakers. I think that's rude. So we're gonna let her finish and then we're gonna ask the questions during the specific Q and A portion because of course the questions may be answered during the talk themselves. Uh, otherwise, yeah, please keep your camera on if you can. Uh, we'd love to see you. Everyone who's on right now, great to see you. Uh, very nice, we like that personal touch. So go ahead and stick the camera on if you can. And uh, we will be uploading a, a recording of this talk to our website. I'll, I'll just let you know that this website, we're kind of overhauling it right now. We are going to revamp, update, patch, and uh, make it look real good. So stay tuned for that in probably January. Uh, otherwise, I say let's get going with our first uh, event here, which is an early career researcher presentation. And that early career researcher is none other than me, the guy who's talking right now. So Sean Lahiri over here, postdoctoral researcher, at University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I figure why not show a video of one of my uh, papers? So I'm gonna talk to you today about social norms change and tobacco use. I'm going to present results from a systematic review and meta-analysis that I did. Uh, of course, uh, I recorded a video, so let us see if you can hear the video. So if uh, you cannot hear the video, uh, Daniel, please unmute and let me know. Thanks for that introduction, Sean. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk to you today about social norms, change, and tobacco use. And this is work done jointly with colleagues from the George Washington University, the University of Iowa, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Now let's get started. As you know, tobacco use is a major problem all over the world. About 8 million people die every year from tobacco related illnesses, and about 80% of that mortality is concentrated in low and middle income countries. We know taxes and laws are the most effective approaches to changing tobacco use, but what do you do when you're in countries with relatively weaker tobacco control policy environments and when you want to reach hardened smokers? So there we have to also target the social dimensions of tobacco use. And key among these dimensions are social norms. Now we know that social norms matter for tobacco initiation, for sustained use, but are the interventions based on social norms to change tobacco use effective? Well, to answer this, we just gotta you know, synthesize the evidence from social norms interventions, which is very difficult because social norms are defined in varied ways 
There's over 100 years of published scholarship on the subject. So where do we begin? Well, I chose to begin with focusing on the active ingredients underlying these social norms interventions called social norms mechanisms. Legros and Sislagi identified five of them, correction of misperceptions, structural changes, legal reforms, uh, role models or influential individuals, and then power dynamics. So thought that was pretty useful. And then I wanted to understand, okay, what do we know? Are these interventions effective? If so, how effective are they? And um, do they use any of these social norms change mechanisms? And if so, which ones are most commonly used? Now, what is a social norms change intervention? Basically a coordinated set of activities designed to change, in this case, tobacco use outcomes that either employ an, an identified social norms change mechanism, or they measure social norms resulting from an intervention, or they mention social norms in the design of the intervention. So I kept it deliberately broad to really see what's out there, but I only wanted to focus on quasi-experimental and experimental studies to get at some estimate of causal effects. So I excluded any studies that didn't do any of these things, basically. Now, I found about 3,000 records, distilled those to about 88 studies included in a narrative synthesis of results, and then I performed a tobacco outcomes meta-analysis using 186 effect sizes from 79 studies, and then a social norms meta-analysis for uh, 64 effect sizes from 27 studies. Now, keep in mind, individual studies can have multiple effect sizes if they have multiple treatment groups, for example, if they have multiple outcomes. So I made sure to use a model specification that accounts for this effect size dependency in meta-analyses. And um, I will say that the tobacco meta-analysis covered about 147,000 people, and the social norms meta-analysis covered about 67,000. Unsurprisingly, most of the evidence was concentrated in the US and Europe, relatively little in Asia, and nothing in Africa and Latin America. Most of the studies were randomized controlled trials, they're school-based programs, and they're relatively long on average, just under a year. And uh, among the studies that measured social norms, friends were the most common reference group. And among the social norm change mechanisms, I found that there was a mechanism that was not identified by Legros and Sislagi that emerged as the most common approach, which I call resistant skills training. Uh, and then in terms of the, the narrative results, like I said, most of the interventions were school-based, the huge education uh, approaches involving usually multiple social norms change mechanisms. And then beyond the classroom, there was a lot of counseling-based approaches, sometimes with medication, uh, and most studies actually didn't even measure social norms, despite mentioning norms as helping design their intervention. Now, in terms of the meta-analysis, we can broadly conclude that on average, they seem to work. These interventions seem to work for changing tobacco use outcomes as well as social norms outcomes. Uh, so this is on standard deviation uh, units, so about 0.23 of a standard deviation on average for tobacco outcomes and 0.28 for social norms outcomes. Now, keep in mind, this is just an average, so it masks a great deal of heterogeneity. So if you break it down by study type, most of the effects are driven by quasi-experimental studies, which have less controlled conditions than RCTs, of course, but the RCTs still had a small but significant effect size on average. Now, when I explored the heterogeneity even more with some meta-regression techniques using the um, mechanisms as covariates, I found that uh, role models really was one of the most common and most effective approaches, but resistance skills training was a, a significant, smaller than role models, but still significant, but it had like the most precision because there was 100 effect sizes there coming from 37 studies. And then the length of the intervention didn't really make any difference. There was no uh, significant effect there for the length of the intervention. So to wrap up my discussion, social norms interventions are effective for changing both norms around tobacco use and actual tobacco use. And we have massive geographical gaps in our evidence. So we need to really scale up and uh, do work in settings where we don't have as much evidence. And also resistance skills training seems to be a new mechanism that we should add to the list by Legros and Sislagi. And it's related to something called social inoculation, which was quite common in, in the 80s. And I'll just wrap up by saying social norms interventions are extremely diverse and focusing on these underlying change mechanisms can help bring us consistency to the field and inform our interventions and policies and programs. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, you know who I am. I'm the guy talking right now. And uh, email me if you ever want to talk norms and behavior change. Thanks very much and have a great uh, talk. All right. Thank you uh, very much to, uh, to me, essentially. Uh, we will, of course, have a whole new crop of uh, early career researcher videos 
starting next year, that will not be me. So uh, if you are interested in social norms, mechanisms, tobacco use, do email me. That is what I do. Uh, <clears throat> but that's not why you're here. You're here for the main event. And the main event, of course, we got Professor Catherine DeVries from Bocconi University. She's going to be delivering a talk here on geographies of discontent, how public service deprivation increased far-right support in Italy. Uh, before uh, she begins, though, just a quick uh, little introduction here. So first of all, Professor DeVries, she's the Dean for International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at Bocconi University. Now, her work is broadly focused on political behavior, political economy, and EU politics. And uh, check this out. She's working on her fourth book, her fourth book on the political consequences of migrant remitt remittances. That's pretty cool. Um, what I'm getting, uh, Catherine, is that if people want to know about EU politics, they got to go to you because you are the expert. So without further ado, uh, Catherine, please go ahead, share your screen, and let's uh, let's get going. Great, uh, Sean. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? I can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to go in slideshow. Yes. So thank you so much for coming. It's a good afternoon to you. Good evening for me. But uh, I'm uh, very excited uh, uh, to be here today. I'm just, oh, that went too quick. Um, uh, indeed, I, I work on a lot of European politics related issues and, and, and um, far right politics is one particular part of that. I was thinking a little bit, it definitely relates to behavior. That's very clear from my talk. I was also thinking it might relate a little bit to norms, although the norms of stigmatization that surrounded far right support traditionally in Europe, I think have kind of been broken. For example, in the last election in Italy, we were the polls on support for Meloni, which is the far right candidate that ultimately became the prime minister were dead on. So I think this is actually more about behavior now than about, you know, a big uh, area of research that I uh, and or that most of the others have done, but that I'm very aware of uh, about stigmatized norms around uh, around far right politics. So what the 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 talk is, a, is a co-authored uh, paper I, together with some, uh, Simone Kremaschi, uh, Marco Cabellutti and Paola Rettel. Uh, and uh, um, Simone is a postdoc. Uh, Paola is a um, uh, a, a PhD, but just got her is negotiating her her tenure track position, so it looks like she's off. And uh, Marco Capelluti is uh, is uh, starting his PhD at the University College of London, and it's part of an ERC, a European Research Council project. We're always supposed to say that it's funded uh, uh, through that. So the starting point of the paper is actually indeed to say that a lot of that norms around far right politics traditionally associated with fascism in Europe and especially in a country like Italy or in a country like Germany that was kind of, let's say, not done right, not supporting far right parties openly. Uh, but what we've seen over the last decades is actually a lot of discontent that has seen a lot of radicalized expression politically. It can either be on the left, it can be on the right, but actually what we've seen is really the rise of far-right politics. And there's kind of two sources that uh, that the literature kind of outlines, which I will show also in a minute. It's things that have to do with material concerns. So that could be, for example, austerity cuts. If we think about the 2008 uh, crisis, financial crisis in Europe that led to a lot of austerity, that also led to the rise of, of far-right uh, politics. Think about the, the party Golden Dawn in Greece, for example, an openly fascist party, uh, but also uh, uh, um, uh, the migrant crisis, or well, we we'll call it crisis, but the migrant flows in 2015 in Europe that also uh, led to a lot of uh, support for anti-immigration parties, which usually are on the, on the far right. And these sources of discontent, I think, are seen in the literature as, um, uh, as um, important sources to try to explain far-right politics, but they have kind of been treated in isolation. So material concerns, exposure to globalization, trade shocks, uh, labor markets, austerity, et cetera, issues that I just talked about that are associated with, uh, with far-right politics. Of course, also a lot of work in economics on, think of Otter et al, uh, on, uh, on the United States and on, on Trump vote, Brexit, a lot of these kind of more uh, far-right political projects that seem to have some material underpinning. A second set of literature actually focuses very much on these migration shocks. So for example, on flows, on actual interaction with, uh, with migrants, it's actually not really in line with contact theory. It leads actually to, to less support for, for, for some migrants. 
settlement, settlement centers, settlement uh, 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 effects, but also demographic patterns. So shifting of demographies, for example, you can think of uh, more progressive people moving to urban areas and more, let's say, quote unquote, parochial uh, or, or traditionally uh, lifestyle focused uh, uh, families or, or people uh, residing in more rural areas. And those demographic patterns that are oftentimes also associated with, with immigration flows that immigration is higher in, in, in urban areas and in rural areas in Europe are also seen to be drivers of the far right. But the interaction between the two things is not really studied. And I've never really understood that. I think a lot of the time that you're standing in society also has to do with not only your, your material concerns, but also with communal concerns. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do in a lot of my work. And this particularly, I'm going to look at one particular channel in which that might come together, and that is in public service provision. So public services provide material goods. They provide access to healthcare, access to education, access to transport, which can actually translate into people, you know, uh, uh, weathering a shock, but also in terms of uh, uh, furthering their position in the labor market, but also public services define who is a citizen, i.e. who is allowed to have access to those public services. So it has a communal part as well as a material part. So in itself, it carries these two things. Note, I will also not try, like many economists might push us to, to isolate one effect of the other. I think this is so intertwined in a lot of the also focus group research that I've said, it's people see this often kind of in tandem and, and, and I, will, I will come back to that later in the talk. Um, so public service deprivation has a, is one of the channels where these material and communal concerns and drivers of far right port, uh, support might come together, but I think that they're also important in their own right, which I will talk to you about in the next uh, slide. I'm kind of used to uh, being uh, being uh, interrupted uh, because the corner is a kind of economic environment, so it's kind of nice that I have some time to to, 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 to get the argument going. And so what we particularly argue and what we also find, so I'm just gonna tell that to you already, but uh, we argue that the degree of access to public service provision and how this changed over time can at least account uh, for uh, uh, some of the increase in far right uh, uh, support that we've seen in this particular case in Italy, but I think it translates to, uh, to other areas. And um, just to give you a sense of the of the effect, overall far right support within Italy has about 18 percent on average uh, uh, is the vote share of the far right. And our public service uh, uh, um, uh, provision measures that I will talk to you in a minute about increased far right, but about one or two percentage points. Note in very close elections, Italy has a right block and a, and a left block and the, and the far right is a part of that right block. Actually, this one or two percent might actually be uh, uh, you know, crucial to an election outcome, but I'm in an American audience, so that's fully understood. I think that you, know, you have razor thin elections. Um, so what we particularly didn't do in this paper, as I said, part of this larger uh, project on, on drivers as far right and combining these communal and, and more material explanations is that we focus on what we call public service deprivation. And I will explain that in a minute. So why do we focus on local public service provision? Because it's actually one of the most direct ways through which people interact with the state and also develop uh, perceptions about how uh, the state performs and how their taxes are being spent. So if we think about a lot after, for example, the vote of Trump or uh, Brexit, but actually we, we saw it in Italian newspapers already after the vote of Berlusconi in the 1990s, a lot of discussion was about left behind places, uh, places that are feeling that they're not getting their fair share of government. So actually, you know, public service uh, uh, delivery and the extent to which people feel they have access to public services uh, is actually one way in which we can capture some of those uh, uh, some of those feelings. So that's what we'll do in this uh, in this paper. Then what do I mean by public service deprivation? Note that the term is just to kind of define as low or if you look at it in terms of a, a static effect reduced when you look at it in a dynamic effect of accessibility to local public services. I'm already gonna say that we're not necessarily going to focus on the quality of those public services. If I'm talking to a, a group of economists, they might say, well, you have lower access to public services, but for example, they're more efficiently delivered. So therefore, you know, there's not necessarily a problem when it comes to public services. So it's very difficult to measure in a, even in a national form, the quality of public services. And we've done a lot of surveys and actually perceptions of similar amounts of public services as measured by, let's say more, objective state-led statistics is perceived very differently across people. So here, what we really are looking at is the access you have to public services, not how you 
view the access. So in some ways, I think we might be looking at a lower bound here, especially in a case like Italy, where people are overly dissatisfied uh, with government on average. It could well be if you also start looking at the quality, you find even stronger uh, uh, effects. But as I said, it's not it's pretty tricky to measure quality perceptions of public services, especially when you're relying on stated preferences where, you know, I have some concerns about uh, uh, demand effects or how, how people are really expressing what they think and if they, they really have thought this through. Um, so public service deprivation here then defined as low or reduced access to local public services, what we, uh, um, how we think that it relates to politics and relates then ultimately to far right politics, which I will outline in the next slide, is that it is exactly this kind of mechanism that we've seen by think of books like um, Ho Shield, uh, Strangers in a Land, but also by Kathy Kramer about Wisconsin, where it was a lot about kind of resentment about elites that didn't care about people like us, right? So when you have low access to public services, the signals to voters that you're, you're spending the same taxes in, in, a, in a country like uh, Italy. You spend the same taxes in your rural community. It might be different in a country like the United States. I don't know what your, how the tax is exactly organized, but in Italy, everybody would pay the same amount of tax for these public services, but you might actually get less for your buck, if you will, in certain cases than others. And that signals to people that public officials or po politicians don't care about their community. So therefore, it's a way, you know, it's a, it's a way in which political discontent, some of the grievances that I talked about before, uh, can actually be fueled. Then the question becomes, you know, what are the electoral consequences? So why would we expect this to ultimately go to one party or, 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 or another? So in, when I talk at the end about alternative explanations, I will also look at things like turnout and left wing vote and other things and incumbent vote. Uh, I can show you already that we don't find any effect. And if we find an effect, it's not in the, not in the direction that maybe one would think about it within political science literature. But we, we, we already expect this type of because of the, you know, the linking to uh, resentment that it's more likely to view the far right overall. And that's also what we find in this paper. So why do we think that this, these grievances associated with low access to public services, why would it fuel uh, support for the far right? So as I said, first, it's kind of a two-step argument. So people who experience reduced access to local public services, they become disgruntled and more susceptible to the idea that the state has left their communities behind and does not provide them with a fair share of resources. And this public service deprivation increases vote shares for the far right, because what we will try to convince you of is that actually this idea of not getting your fair share of resources fuels concerns about uh, um, immigrants that are in the country that are competing for access to public services. So basically what happens in the areas where public services it is provided, people are, are unhappy about their fair share of government and they have the feeling that other people within their community uh, are partly to blame uh, 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 for this. And the scarcity of resources increases the concern uh, uh, over the competition that they might, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 feel is there with immigrants. And we build up on a large set that I, I, I don't want to kind of rehash here, but a large set of economics and political science papers that show that people, A, perceive immigrants to, to um, use public services more than natives. This is not actually what, what in reality is the case, but people do think that. Uh, and secondly, also that people are very concerned when it comes to migration, not only about labor market competition, but also about competition with public services. So I do think that our argument might be scoped within the European context where you have public services which are universally accessible, are uh, uh, publicly orientated. There is virtually no private provider if you're looking at the continent, right? So uh, in the UK, there might be some, but schooling is public. Uh, there's virtually no private hospitals. You know, this is really core uh, uh, service, public services are delivered by public uh, resources. So these kind of arguments probably, I think, should be scoped in an environment where public services are generous overall and there's not a lot of competition through private actors. So uh, in that way, I do want to scope this, uh, this argument. So what we do then empirically, we focus on both the degree of public service deprivation. So to say first, that there is something about this, the, your low access to public services that make you disgruntled and therefore uh, vote for the far right, that should be there if we compare different places and their access to public services. 
as well as a change in public services, because we could be very concerned that places who have low or high access to public services vary on a whole set of other characteristics. So in order to causally identify the effect of public service deprivation or reduced access to public services, what we will do is we will exploit a law in Italy at a certain population threshold uh, that allows us to uh, isolate the effect of public services and to show that there is indeed also a causal effect of public service deprivation on far right support. So what we will do now is I will give you evidence from three studies and hopefully that will convince you of our argument. If it doesn't, I would like to have a discussion with you and also hear about other things. This is ongoing work, uh, but uh, you know, provide you with, with three sets of studies that, that tries to dig deeper into public service uh, deprivation first, where we, uh, where we introduce a measure and we do that at the, uh, at the kind of static level. So we're comparing levels in Italy across different municipalities of the degree to which they experience low access to public services or the, the population of those municipalities experiences low access of public, uh, to public services. But there, of course, what we're doing is not necessarily a causal, a causal design, right? So the second study, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, that's interesting. We have this kind of direct, this, this, this correlation between public service deprivation and far-right support, but does it also hold when we kind of put it to a more stringent test where we're exploring a reform that increased public service deprivation in certain municipalities? And then we can compare it to those that were not that were under a different population threshold. So we're kind of comparing like with like, and 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 I'll I'll explain that in a, in a minute uh, that this reduction in public service deprivation in then similar areas uh, um, uh, that are similar on many other characteristics that we that we are more kind of certain about the effect to isolate the effect of uh, public service deprivation. And then uh, we do there already a heterogeneous treatment effect that gives us a little sense of if our mechanism. Uh, that is uh, based on competition, fear, or concern about competition with migrants actually bears out in the data. And the third study, what we'll do is we'll geolocate existing survey data, linking it back to the reform, uh, the kind of quasi-experimental design that we use or the natural experiment that we use uh, in order to, to get at like, you know, is this really the mechanism that we are proposing? And also then at the end, I will deal with some alternative explanations and walk you uh, through that. I, 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 can, I can also give some more information about that in the Q&A. Um, so first is actually the most important question, I guess, is, you know, like, okay, it sounds nice, Catherine, like public service deprivation, low access to public services, but what do you, you know, how do you, how do you go about measuring that? Or what is it a characteristic of? So the, 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 um, the title of the talk was also geographies of discontent. So what we're looking at here is public service deprivation is not an attribute of a person, because what we're looking at is, is kind of, if you have access to those services and those are located in a particular geography. So these are characteristics of geographies. Within that, of course, there could be people who are more or less likely uh, uh, to be able to use those public services because they are um, older, so they find it more difficult to go somewhere or they need more public services. But what we're here looking at is really at the kind of aggregate municipal level. So what we're looking at is municipal returns for the far right and then looking at public service deprivation at the municipal level. In the last study, we're trying to get at that, at a, you know, at the kind of individual like a mechanism a little bit more. So this is kind of very common and standard in the in the field on, on geography, uh, which we're, we're basing our measure on, where, where uh, uh, many people have already developed quite fine-grained measures of local public service deprivation and also specifically within the Italian context. And the way that we capture public service deprivation is using the driving distance to the nearest public service hub. So public services are usually, um, um, you know, can have a lot of a lot of characteristics, right? What I what I what I already said. It can be uh, tr uh, public transport. It can be in hospital. It can be secondary schools. It can be garbage collection. It can be, you know, police. It can be a whole lot of different things. So what we do here and where we have the data on, we would ideally even have more data on on public services. But these are the kind of three elements that we have data on. Uh, we uh, define as public service hub municipalities or clustering of neighboring municipalities that feature a cross-regionally connected train station. So many people in Europe, right, uh, are um, 
uh, commute to work via train, or I, for example, went to school uh, going by train. It's very common. And what you then often need is that, that, that in order for you, for example, to be able to go to the job that you want, but you don't want to pay the house price in a particular big city, you want to have this cross-regional connected train station. So it's not a local tram network, but it's really a train station that allows people to commute for work or commute for education. Um, secondly, a hospital that doesn't only have emergency services, so let's say the basic services, note differently to the United States, People have healthcare in in uh, in uh, it's a it's a general uh, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of public uh, uh, given there. You, yeah, of course you need to pay a little bit for it, but it's but people who can't pay uh, they get it for free. Um, so uh, um, uh, a hospital would be publicly available, and there's virtually no private hospitals, right? Maybe the private hospitals are there for cosme cosmetic surgery or or something like that, but it's really not uh, not for your basic health needs. So a hospital with only emergency services is not a hospital where if you have something else when it comes to disease, you could be served even when it comes to, uh, to uh, you know, regular check checkups. So what we're looking at is really uh, hospitals here that have more than those services, so also observation, short stay, et cetera. Then the third thing, uh, what we're looking at in public services is a full uh, offer of secondary schools. So that means that you don't only in your municipality can do a uh, uh, or in the in the in the kind of neighboring sets of municipalities can do a primary school, but you can also do a secondary school. And then the secondary school is in Europe. You have high schools in the U.S. You would have high schools with advanced placement. Those would be kind of different different types of high schools uh, uh, within the Italian system. We can differentiate between that, but it doesn't really matter. It, it works uh, uh, generally for that. So it's a full offer of secondary school, so that you can get all the way up to a high school degree. Uh, which in Italy you will be 18 or 19 when you get that before you can go to university or any form of vocational school afterwards. So this is what public service deprivation looked like in 2014. Note it's extremely difficult to find this data and also to, especially in the Italian context, and then also to, to be able to, uh, to get it from driving distances, right? So these uh, kind of uh, lighter areas are those areas that are very well connected in terms of the public service deprivation. And the darker shades are those that are much more um, uh, publicly servicely deprived. So some of you might think, well, that's probably just pick, picking up an urban-rural divide, right? So cities will have many more of those, uh, will be much more connected than others. But interestingly, what we find, definitely there is a correlation between being urban and rural. And urban and rural is often defined standard in the literature as a combination of population and population density. But, it, but our public service deprivation covers more than just urban-rural divides. So here on the left, uh, in the first column, you see the distance to public services hubs, so the first, third, and second. Uh, and a second, third, third child. And then you see the, uh, the, the second and the third column are the urban and rural uh, classifications based on population and population density. Yes, we see that in terms of distance of two public services in urban areas, about 56% uh, uh, are well connected, but a very considerable amount is uh, about 30% in the second quartile and about 15% is in the third quartile. And you see the same with rural, even pre pretty, you know, a little bit, a little bit starker. 20% is actually very well connected, 35% is in the middling category, 44% is deprived, right? So there is a correlation between urban and rural, but we're really capturing something more than urban rural. We also, in all our models that I show now, so not the causal ones because we don't have to, but in the, these ones, we are. Uh, uh, we are, of course, also controlling for population and population density. So the first kind of thing is to convince you of, I think, is that there is actually a link to this public service deprivation, so the driving distance to public service hubs in the way that we define it now, and uh, far-right support. Uh, and then before we go into actually thinking about more causal effects. So what we do here, but it works in a kind of more continuous uh, form as well, uh, I just give them here for, for kind of ease of interpretation. So we have here the reference category being a very well connected, then the third and the and the uh, the second and the third church house in terms of driving distance, i.e., being further away from those public service hubs, so being more publicly servicely deprived. Uh, and what you see is that it's about a 1.6 percent increase for the far right uh, um, when we uh, do not have municipal controls. It goes back to about one percent, and when we add municipal controls, it's about 2.8 percent for the third church house. So the very public servicely deprived, it goes with municipal controls to 1.3 percent or one and a half percent, right? Uh, increase for the far right. So it fits the story that we had, but of course here we can be very concerned that 
uh, public service deprivation and the air and the municipalities that are lower or higher on public service deprivation or better connected to the public service hub or worse connected to the public service hub vary on a whole set of other characteristics that we're not that we're not capturing here right so what we want to do in the second study is basically isolate the effect of public service deprivation more in a, in a kind of more causal framework. And then what we'll also look at is a more dynamic effect. So not the degree of public service deprivation, but the change in public service deprivation. So comparing municipalities that have, inc that have seen an increase in public service deprivation, do we then see also the, the associated far increase in far right support that we would predict based on our expectations? So what we do is we use a reform. Uh, so in many European countries, there are a lot of different small municipalities, and they are historically uh, uh, developed like that. For especially Italy and France have huge amounts of small municipalities. So, for example, uh, we're looking at a reform that affects municipalities that are at about a 5,000 uh, population threshold. For an American audience, you might think, well, that's... That cannot be many municipalities. Well, it's about 70% of municipalities in Italy. So this was actually a huge reform because many of the municipalities are super small. You can, of course, understand under fiscal constraints, under you know more thinking about efficient government, uh, there's been a lot of movements in European countries to try to reduce that layer of government and actually see more economies of scale and reduce the number of municipalities. So in Italy, the, the kind of reform cycle started in 19, 1990, where uh, municipalities were allowed to merge and a union, a union and a union means that you share public services. So what it effectively means, you have one municipality, you have the other municipality and you decide to close down the services in one municipality and you, and you, and you leave them open in the other, right? Or parts of one in one, and, but you don't duplicate them. So you basically share the public services in union. Uh, and that was only uh, a first step to a merger. You can, of course, understand that there are a lot of different reasons that municipalities might want to sh share public services, but they would not necessarily want to merge as municipalities. So the Italian, there was very, very low take up, as you see here on uh, the right hand uh, uh, figure. So in 1999, the Italian uh, government introduced the start of a union without the requirement of a merger afterwards. Still, the take up is a little bit higher, as you see, there's a couple of unions, but it's very small. You see that to the end of the graph, you see the increase in uh, in in uh, in, uh, in mergers and unions. And that was because in 2010, in the time of the financial crisis, where there were a lot of cost cutting reforms that were put through in uh, in, in Italian politics, the, the Italian government was you know, not happy about this this low take up. Of, uh, of, uh, of the unions of sharing public services. So they required it from municipalities at a certain population threshold. You might question here like, oh, the reform was in 2010. And then you see this huge increase in, uh, in the unions and mergers. So they could merge still, right? That's still allowed uh, to do. It's a very small amount of municipalities that do. It doesn't matter if we, ch if we, if we differ between the two, uh, uh, they have the same effects. Um, that you see that the actual union, the unionizing, let's say, of municipalities, but not unionizing as in the way we think, but unionizing as in sharing public services, uh, that that happened only after 2013. And that's because there was a grace period covered for the by the government to do this because it's very difficult. We've done a lot of in-depth interviews with mayors. This is, of course, very difficult to do, right? You need to decide which to which municipality opens what and, and which, which is closed. So they had, a, they had a three year period to do that. And then we see a little bit of a tail in this figure too. And that is from municipalities that due to administrative reasons were not able to comply within time and they were giving an extension of the grace period, right? So we have at different times uh, that these uh, municipalities go, but what we use is the fact that there is a, that there is a, a force per population uh, threshold that forces municipalities uh, to uh, to to uh, to share these public services jointly, the 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 overall threshold was five thousand for mountainous municipalities, so that are high up in the mountain. It was three thousand. So that's the cutoffs we use either for mountainous areas and for um, for not for the kind of general municipalities. So the model specification is that we're interested here in the far right vote share, right? In municipality at time t, we have a treatment dummy. Uh, which is what the 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 the, the reform. Uh, then we have election fixed effects. We have a uh, we have municipal fixed effects, and then um, um, we do an RDD in our appendix, which I'm not going to show now. Uh, uh, why don't I? Sh why don't why isn't the RDD our 
uh, preferred specification because we have a little bit of a concern about um, the um, uh, manipulation around the threshold. So it works huh, in the RDD, but uh, mayors could decide which population data of which census they use. And of course, then if, if you can just go for 20 above 20 before, there will be cut off around the population threshold is probably not ideal, but as I said, it holds even in the RDD. So what we use as our preferred specification is to use a matching uh, uh, effect, and we can also uh, uh, do that in particular bandwidths, uh, and we match on the whole set of, uh, of characteristics, population side, mean altitude, uh, employment rates, share of, uh, uh, share of elderly, share of young, share of females, and so on. So why do we do that? You know, you can understand that we're basically comparing a whole set of small municipalities, but then also, you know, 30% uh, of larger municipalities. So they might also differ in other degrees. As I said, the RDD works as well, uh, but, uh, but I think the matching is our preferred specification. So what's then the effect of the exposure to this reform? So then the reform means that the municipality had after the grace period in 2013. So the effect of the reform can be on voting uh, can be observed in the 2013 and 2018 uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, election. So what we see here is that the exposure to the reform increases with half percentage point, uh, the, the vote for the far right uh, in both of the specifications. Uh, we also use, uh, I mean, we show parallel trends, but also use a placebo, just some time, a random time point before in our data set to show that that does not have an effect. So that's really, you know, centered around the reform. Some of you who are critical might say, well, Catherine, nice, this reform, you have to share these uh, public services, but I would like to see that it actually changed something on the ground. So do we really see a reduced access in public services? So this is, of course, a very important question, but you can understand that in the Italian context, it took about one and a half year to collect this data. Uh, data about uh, uh, now we couldn't do the same thing with the, the schools, so it's slightly different, but this is the data that we were able to find consistently. So what we do here is we're comparing the access to local police, that means how uh, often the local police is, uh, is, uh, is on the ground in, a, uh, in, a, um, in an Italian municipality, in the municipality, before and after the reform. The same hours of openness to, to public, for the public registry and also how much garbage collection uh, is done. Garbage collection in the US might not be a big issue, but as you maybe have seen sometimes photos from Rome, in the Italian context, there are places in which garbage collection and the amount of garbage collection is a serious political issue. So what we see here and the way that we measure it is, uh, the way it's measured is by the Italian government, uh, what's called against the standard demand. So you have a size of the of, of a municipality, and then you would expect that the local, that so many local police officers patrol for so many hours. There's like a, a general baseline expectation by the government. The same goes for the hours of the public registry. The same goes for the garbage collection. And what we're now able to show is that measured before and after the reform, that there was a reduction in uh, the hours spent by local police in those municipalities. The hours for public registry that they're open is reduced and garbage collection is reduced. Then I said, I'm not gonna be able to do something about the quality, but then the Italian government did have some measures about the quality of those public services. So we also showed that. So uh, this is a little bit of a black box, how the government exactly measures this quality. They say they do it on experts. I couldn't, you know, I show it to you here, but I'm not entirely sure how it's exactly measured. I can give you the standard definition of the Italian government, but I don't fully uh, understand how that was done, but it's basically by expert that went to municipalities and. Uh, graded the, 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 the quality and how they saw it of the public services, we see with the exception of the local police where the effect has not reached the fiscal significance, but it's still in the expected direction, that we also see then a reduction in the quality. But I mean, we focus more on access, the previous slide that's closer to also what we did before, but anyway, just to give you a little bit of a glimpse. So we showed you that at the level effect, there is, a, there is an effect of the degree of public service division and far right support, but also when we isolate it into a reform that really reduced the, 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 local pub, the, the, the access to local uh, public services in those affected municipalities at that population threshold, that that increased support for the far right. So in a kind of more stringent, of course, it went from about one and a half percent to about half percent, but you know, like that is also comes from the more stringent causal testing, right? Uh, but still within close elections, that's, uh, that's considerable. So now to move into the last part of the talk, which is basically to think a little bit about what, what is driving this. So why does it go to the far right? And I said in the alternative explanations, I will also you know, just discuss with you that it doesn't have other political effects. 
that you might be wondering about, uh, is that what we first do is we do a heterogeneous treatment effect of the share of foreign born residents and exposure to this reform, right? So uh, basically we look uh, pre-treatment, so let's say pre the reform, either there's been uh, the, the, apps, the kind of the overall share of, of, of uh, foreign born in a municipality or the increase in the share of foreign born. And what we show is that exposure to the reform is more pronounced in the areas that have a higher share of foreign born or have seen a recent increase in the share of foreign born. And that is consistent with the idea that we would that 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 we outlined before, and I will give you in the last study some more evidence to back that up. That what happens in these areas, and that links to the material and communal concerns that I was I was talking about before, is that yes, people people have these grievances. They have something has been reduced. They they're they're paying the same taxes, but they're getting less public services or less access to public services as a result of this, but why does it lead to the far right? Because it fuels concerns over competition for those public services with, uh, uh, with immigrants. So to explore this even more in the last thing, uh, we go to the individual level. And what we do is we use uh, an Italian national election survey and in a, in a, in a panel framework and that allows us to geocode respondents to municipalities that were affected by the 2010 reform. So we really are able to do exactly what we did before, that those people who were who were living in the municipalities that experienced public service deprivation versus those that didn't, uh, we have um, uh, uh, we have a very sim you know kind of similar setup uh, to uh, to the one that I gave you before. So we look at the effect of the exposure to the reform on two dependent variables, and I would have preferred to have also had a uh, a third dependent variable, which was uh, 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 you know how people thought about. Uh, their level of public services and their grievances about those, but unfortunately that was not in the survey. But if our uh, findings will, uh, will uh, if our mechanism, preferred mechanism, uh, should have any bearing in the data, we should expect that people are more likely to see themselves on the more extreme right, so identify themselves more on the on the far right, and also that they are more concerned about immigration. And we have two measures of anti-immigration concern, uh, concern over kind of the, 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 the values and the culture that immigrants uh, uh, um, bring that might be in, in kind of jeopardizes the quote unquote Italian culture, whatever that, whatever an Italian culture is. Uh, and uh, the other element would be competition over, uh, over uh, resources, economic resources. That's kind of closer to our mechanism, but it works in, uh, in both ways. Hence that I say that, it, that I'm not so sure if it's only communal or, or material, it's probably a combination of both. So what we see is that exposure to the reform um, increases uh, people's willingness to put themselves more to the, to the, to the, to the right on a, on a left-right uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, sorry, a left-right uh, ideological scale, uh, and also makes people more concerned about immigrants. And I said both about kind of cultural attributes of immigrants, but also about competition over economic resources. So that's in line with the mechanism that we uh, that we outlined, uh, and we also can replicate the same effect that those individuals that lived in those reformed uh, in those uh, areas that saw the public service deprivation also display. Uh, a higher likelihood to vote for the far right in the survey, but we already established that, I think, in a better way by not using stated preferences, but actual returns. So there are perhaps some alternative explanations that you might be thinking about and you wanted to, if you were in a more econ talk, would have like bombarded me with, but now you had to wait until the end of the talk. But uh, I think uh, I think it's fine. I hope uh, I hope we can discuss it in the Q and A. So uh, I already said that some people might have said because of the important work by Kathy Kramer on more kind of rural consciousness and rural resentment that this is kind of an urban rural thing. So what we show is that uh, public service deprivation is not to not one to one correlated with the urban rural divide. Uh, there might be some affinity, but it's definitely not uh, not uh, not actually a strong correlation. And also, it really can account for the fact that a lot of empirical work suggests that there's also a lot of support for the far right in certain urban areas in Europe. And actually, what we can show within the Italian context, at least, those are particular urban areas. Those are urban areas that are very public service deprived, right? So that is allows us also to get a mechanism that explains both what's happening in certain you know geographies of discontent in the urban areas. And in the and in the rural one, and move beyond the urban rural divide. Uh, I come from a very rural divide, rural environment, and my parents were always very resentful of urban elites, and they never voted for the far right. I think they just, 
you know, start to vote for the far right when they thought that that the, that 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 the government was not give, li, um, living up to their side of the, of, of the bargain, whatever. You know, like when it came to access to to public services. Um, you know, if that's right or wrong, I will leave here. But uh, but I think that was a lot of the feelings uh, that they might have had. So public service deprivation here, just to kind of uh, you know underline that again, is characterized by the degree of access, not necessarily by the perceived quality of services. So we are now working on more survey research to get at those, uh, but I'm not so you know like we've tested also different things and and uh, and uh, find a little bit of differential item responses and like uh, we're not so sure how you know like we're not if anybody can guide us to good research that's do, that's done this. I've seen a lot of surveys, but I'm, I've not been so convinced that they all measure really the quality of public services. Um, so then, I mean, a, a very important political science explanation will be, well, this is just, you just turn against the government that, that introduced that, that public service deprivation reform. So like, that's it. It's an, uh, it's, I'm, I myself uh, doesn't do a lot of economic voting or performance voting. So like, that's basically what it is. So interestingly, the Italian context is not the easiest one for electoral consequences of reforms because A, it reforms a lot. And then secondly, the governments just hold for about one and a half year. So by the time you are voting, there, you know, there's the, 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 the same government might have not been the case. Imagine that we had this 2010 election, 2010 reform when it was introduced. It was actually gone through parliament in 2008, and there had been three governments between that and 2013. So who do you hold accountable? We don't find an effect on the incumbent, but I think that is reasonably to be expected within the Italian context because we see so much government overturn. Uh, then uh, another kind of political explanation that we could have is that, well, it's just kind of anti-establishment sentiment, you know, it's anti-state sentiment, and this should, uh, this should benefit the far right. So it's not this mechanism that you provide over immigrants. So in the survey, we also have a lot of anti-establishment measures. So are you anti the government? Do you trust politicians? Do you trust parliament? A whole set of those measures, and we don't find an increase in the same way that we have. So uh, geocoding the people in the localities that experience the reform, we don't find an increase in distrust in government. We don't find an increase uh, in disapproval of the government. So we don't think that that anti-establishment per se is driving this. And then the last thing that we look at and uh, and do a lot of uh, uh, thing with in the appendix or so of the paper is to maybe, you know, we could and this, we could think, well, you know, maybe you want to have a party that just increases public services again, right? So they've just been deprived and then you want to go for a party that increases it. So you would be more likely to vote for a party that is more pro-redistribution. Pro and actually, we don't find that. And in certain specifications, we find null effects or actually an, in, a decrease for pro uh, for pro redistribution parties as effect of the reform. And one thing, uh, you know, we are looking deeper into this. Note we've done another uh, paper uh, about an economic shock and show that public service deprived areas are much more likely to uh, um, attach e extreme economic, uh, extreme political consequences for when they've experienced an economic shock. So when you're deprived and you get a shock on top of that, you go even further to the far right, right? And uh, so if I can find anything that is related to public services and it moves to the left, I would love to hear about it. But in the Italian context, we really, you know, we've tried a lot, we cannot find it. And I think it also relates a little bit is that people have kind of, you know, Paul Pearson calls this the age of austerity, like that people also think that that is just not credible to increase public services with a lot because, you know, state budgets are, are constrained, even also a lot of work by Alessina kind of showing that, uh, that, uh, that people are actually thinking that it cannot that money cannot be spent. And it, I think also makes in some more sense, if you've just been uh, deprived of your public services, it doesn't seem very credible for a party to come up later, oh, we're gonna overturn that entire reform and we're gonna do it again, right? So that might be different reasons why you don't see this, uh, this, left, uh, this left response. So just to very quickly uh, sum up, hopefully I'm within time. So we uh, empirically argue and empirically, uh, sorry, theoretically argue and empirically substantiate that public service deprivation helps us to explain geographies of discontent. Remember, public service deprivation relates to public service hubs and, and is a kind of municipal concern. So the hence that we look at municipal returns, uh, we show that the level of public service deprivation coincides uh, with more far right support. And in order to get more causal traction, we use this national reform in Italy, forcing municipalities at a certain population threshold to share or unionize their public services. Uh, to show that it's also increased far right support, while eh, it's uh, it left uh, pro redistribution support unchanged or actually reduced it, and that this effect is more pronounced in areas that have seen a, that have a larger share of foreign born population or an in a recent increase in the share of foreign born population. And with survey data, we also show that in those municipalities that were affected by this reform, 
uh, and public service deprivation was reduced, as we will, as we show that that uh, is indeed what happened. Uh, people become more anti-immigrant and identify themselves more to the right or more to the extreme on a, on a far right uh, scale uh, towards that uh, right poll. And that's the presentation. And I really look forward to kind of discussing with you and have any comments. And there's a lot of other projects we're doing in this area, so uh, it will uh, field into this. Uh, uh, paper, but also if you have other ideas of what we can do, that's also very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and uh, perfectly stuck to time. Thank you for that okay. as well. Good. Yeah. So now uh, let's open the floor up uh, for some questions and comments. Uh, if you have a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat, uh, or just uh, you know even unmute. But I think we can uh, we can begin perhaps with uh, Christina because Christina, I think. Uh, <laughs> I feel like uh, you'd probably know this uh, context pretty well, uh, Italy and all that. Well, some of it, uh, some of <laughs> it. Uh, but I know I'm a friend of Fabrizio Barca, so I know <laughs> I know the work he does. Uh, one question I have, uh, I think it's very interesting. First of all, thank you for the very interesting talk. And um, it's very interesting also uh, what you say about uh, uh, this uh, uh, aggregation uh, municipalities. Uh, I have experienced it myself, actually, uh, where, for example, there were maybe small hospital and they closed them and there is one larger hospital and for many, many people is uh, a long way to get there, etc, etc, etc. So this is happening uh, um, regionally in many, many, uh, many areas. Now, what, uh, um, and you know, I understand the measure of uh, uh, public service deprivation. And actually, I think uh, is a very interesting thing what you said at the beginning, uh, uh, how people interact with the state is uh, the local public service. And so the perception of the state, the image of the state is very much colored by that. Now, one thing I wonder, um, if looking at the map, but uh, I could say even without looking at the map, uh, there is uh, uh, an enormous amount of public service deprivation in the south, in the southern region. Fine. And we know that, uh, so I expected it. The, the question is, these are regions where traditionally there has been higher far-right support. So, is a very traditional basing for the fascist, basically. You know, people who vote for uh, uh, Movimento Sociale, now it has another name, but it used to be Movimento Sociale, were very much concentrated in the Southern regions. And uh, so the question is, uh, you know, these, uh, if you will increase uh, in deprivation, because uh, this aggregation of municipality increases, a deprivation in certain areas, etc. Uh, I don't know if it had uh, uh, such a negative effect uh, on voting behavior, let's say in Tuscany, okay, or uh, in Emilia Romagna or in Liguria. Uh, so what what I wonder is, uh, did you check for? So there is a, a uh, there is a timeline, okay, of uh, uh, municipality aggregation, okay, and you see that. Now, did you check and you see, you know, uh, there is uh, more right-wing voting uh, in certain areas, but did you check for previous voting behavior? So the question is, uh, was there really a significant change? Because where there should be a change is in Tuscany. Okay, in Tuscany, leftist by tradition, Emilia Romagna, lefty by tradition, and you say, okay, there is this aggregation, these things are happening, you know, people are moving more to the right. Uh, have you done that by region, for example? Thank you very much. I mean, that's also a very uh, uh, important question and no wonder coming from someone uh, who has a clear link to, uh, to Italy, of course, a lot of things are, uh, are regional and uh, now my response moving to Italy, someone asked me, oh, so how is Italy? I said, that's a very difficult question. You have to now specify which part of Italy you're talking about, right? So yes. it's very regionally varied. Yeah. Um, so what we are not able to, let's, what we do is we jackknife with regions. So take one region out and then see what goes. We're not able to isolate, to run the model, let's say, 
only on Tuscany because it just reduces the power that we have. So what we do is we jackknife, so taking certain regions out, right. and we do uh, le uh, north or north, middle, south, yeah. or north, south. And we do find effects in uh, across the board, but you're right, they're slightly more pronounced in the north and in the middle than they're in the south, probably because the baseline is higher in the yeah. south. But yeah. interestingly, uh, I didn't have time to, first I thought, okay, I can put it in here, but I can't. So we are now working on uh, to capture that a bit uh, where, where I am convinced that also in the South, it had a considerable effect. What we do in, an, in a paper that, that we are now, uh, uh, this already working paper that we are working at the moment, we're using the Xylella bacteria that hit olive groves in Puglia, yeah. in the South of Italy, yes. that was staggered through the, the, the province. This is a province that had, of course, traditionally, as you say, some far right, was now ruled by PD, uh, by the Social Democrats. Yeah. And we are able there also to look at differences in public service deprivation, and then uh, basically comparing those that have experienced this shock of, so what happens for those who, the bacteria forced people, uh, forced farmers to, ex to exterminate their entire olive grove. So these are sometimes, you know, 300 years old trees that were used basically for livelihoods. And they these olive groves had to be exterminated fully. Yes. And what we find is that a consistent swing to the far right. And that far right swing is more pronounced in municipalities that had also been affected by this reform in 2010. So that, that and now we're doing some, we're doing some behavioral games and some and some like in-depth interviews with farmers to try to understand. And what we hear a lot is basically this is story about, I mean, the, the Italian government doesn't care about us, right? And then and then when this also happens, the only ones who, who want to bring, uh, you know, whatever grandeur back is the far right, basically, right? So yeah. even in municipalities that were previously voting for the Social Democrats would be the opposite of, uh, of the party. Yeah. So I do think that there is maybe something, and I said at the beginning of the talk that I'm not working on norms, but you could see this in some ways as these kind of reforms that also in younger generations could activate something that was already there in certain regions. We don't look at this now, right? We're just looking. But I, I do think it could be that there has been, that, that if you think about geography of discontent in a, in a historical way, that that in some ways when you know like there's so in some ways you could say it's more difficult to find stuff in the south because they've all they have very low expectations of the state to begin with and we do find that but it could also be another mechanism could be that well they were prone to have a longer legacy so what we're doing now is we're collecting all the data on the fascist referendums and the monarchy ref the monarchy referendum to try to look at this kind of legacy effect yes. but i don't know yet so we i i do you know i just wanted to say i can't do that, that we that we take your concern very seriously and think also that there is something of longer effects but even in the south where you would say they're a quite prone to to the far right and are very disgruntled with the government to 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 begin with yeah. we find effects especially when there's also a trigger i.e you know when there was this this uh this big uh yeah, if I were you, I, I, I suggest to look at Tuscany, which okay. is traditionally a red the, region. Which is on the other side. Yeah. And uh, it was completely on the other side. Yeah. You know, uh, Putnam, when he studied, uh, yeah, true, uh, true. you know, yeah. he, he studied Tuscany. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has a, a great civic tradition, etc. This is an interesting case. I, I, I guess. People yeah. voted more to the right. At yeah. this point, yeah, you know, the left yeah. lost a lot. Exactly, exactly. And, so to look at that, no, and, no, the, no, and uh, there is certainly uh, uh, there is uh, a greater, much greater public service deprivation. Yeah. This I know directly, and uh, but the question is, uh, uh, you know, why even a lot of young people, you know, started voting for yeah. Giorgia Meloni? Yeah. And this yeah. is a, a big question Great in the idea. red region, because that, yeah. Is, yeah. you know, there is no tradition there for the right. Exactly. No, no, exactly. No, that's, that's a great idea. Great idea. I, I, yeah. Let's, let's, there. <laughs> exactly. Which, no, which, great, thank you. Why I ask myself all the time, the, <laughs> why, why is it happening? Sorry, I'm taking too much time. No, no, my entire research agenda is trying to understand why people vote for the far right when they sometimes do, you know, like when it quote unquote does not always fit some of the other characteristics that they exactly. have. So I think, I think this, exactly. uh, this makes a lot of sense. Exactly. Yeah. That's what's happening. 
All right, we have about uh, six minutes remaining if anyone from the audience has any questions. So let me put it to you, audience. So you got any questions? You got any comments? Uh, because it seems like you completely buy it, what Catherine presented. You I'm got sure it. not the case. <laughs> you got anything to say? I mean, it seems like the audience is satisfied, if you ask me. So I, if there's nothing else, I suggest we, we close the talk and we thank Catherine very much for uh, doing it in the evening, first of all, and, and agreeing to do the talk. So thank you uh, so much, Catherine. And uh, I will also like to say that's the end of No Back Talks for 2022. So starting on January 19th, we got a presentation from Erta Xiao on uh, no intention to profit, no repugnance, question mark. Very provocative title. I like that. So uh, we'll see you in 2023. Thanks again to Catherine. And everybody have a good New Year's. Take care. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and for all of your attention. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank, Thank you, you and bye take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.